February is Black History Month. But why? Where did Black History Month come from? It began with this man, Carter G. Woodson, a historian and writer. Woodson noticed that his people were, quote, overlooked, ignored, and even suppressed by the writers of history textbooks and the teachers who use them, end quote. So he started a Black History Week, and people celebrated it enthusiastically. They started Black History Clubs, and teachers started recognizing the contributions of Black Americans in their classrooms. He chose February, by the way, because it held the birthdays of both Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass, two men he believed had done tremendous work for the rights and liberties of African Americans. It took another 50 years, though, for Black History Month to become officially recognized by our government. The president at the time, Gerald Ford, said that we should seize the opportunity to honor the two often neglected accomplishments of black Americans in every area of endeavor throughout our history. Here's the funny thing, though. Carter G. Woodson hoped that someday people would no longer celebrate Black History Month. He saw the day when it would no longer be necessary, when finally we would see black history in America for what it really is, an essential part of American history. The color of the skin is in no way connected with strength of the mind or intellectual powers. Those are the words of Benjamin Banneker, and his entire life was proof of what he said. His math skills were so impressive that at age 22, he built a clock, carving all the gears himself out of wood. Banneker then went to work for a surveyor, laying out a 10 mile by 10 mile square of land. His job was to make the astronomical observations necessary to lay out that square of land perfectly. That square, by the way, became the District of Columbia, Washington, D.C., our nation's capital. Banneker used his tremendous scientific knowledge to publish an almanac so that everyone from farmers to sailors would know when the high tide would be, what time the sun would setting, the phases of the moon. He calculated all this and laid it out in an almanac. Banneker's accomplishments are celebrated in books with an honorary postage stamp. And across this country, there are schools, elementary schools, high schools, academies, charter schools named in his honor. As great of a mathematician and scientist as Banneker was, he wasn't all math and science. He wrote to Thomas Jefferson complaining how Jefferson was all for the rights and liberties of people, but at the same time owned slaves himself. Banneker wrote Jefferson that, quote, you should at the same time be found guilty of that most criminal act which you professedly detested in others, end quote. In the end, we'll always remember Benjamin Banneker as a great mathematician and scientist. Education is the key to unlock the golden door of freedom, George Washington Carver said, and he would know. Though born a slave, Carver learned to read and write from his master's wife. Later, after abolition, He couldn't go to the local white school and so had to walk 10 miles to the nearest school he could attend. After finishing high school, Carver was accepted to college, only to be turned away when he showed up for classes and they realized he was black. So he went elsewhere to earn not only a bachelor's degree, but also his master's degree in botany, the study of plants. From there, Booker T. Washington selected Carver to run the Tuskegee Institute's Agricultural Department where he would do his greatest work. As he said, education is the key to unlock the golden door of freedom. Carver realized that cotton farming was taking all the nutrients from the soil and that the boll weevil could come in and wipe out crops in entire states, so he found other crops farmers could plant to return nutrients to the soil. He not only taught farmers to rotate their cotton crops with sweet potatoes, peanuts, soybeans, and other plants, he famously devised over 300 uses for peanuts, everything from medicine to massage oil. Carver also said that when you do the common things in life in an uncommon way, you will command the attention of the world. And his life and work demonstrated his uncommon scientific genius in such a way that he did indeed command the attention of the world. World War II was a tough and bloody war. 
and soldiers often needed blood transfusions to keep them alive after being injured. The problem was, donated blood only kept for two days. Dr. Charles Drew changed that, however, when he developed a way for blood with the plasma removed to remain usable for seven days. And this seemingly little medical advance saved thousands of lives in World War II. Drew attended college on an athletic scholarship and became Columbia University's first African-American Doctor of Medical Sciences graduate. He was also the first black surgeon to serve on the American Board of Surgery. But it was his Blood for Britain project during the war that remained his greatest achievement. Almost 15,000 people donated blood to save the lives of British soldiers, and his blood bank led to the American Red Cross establishing a blood bank as well. Dr. Charles Drew not only innovated, achieved, and saved lives, though, he stood up for what he believed in. When the United States War Department said that blood from white donors had to be kept segregated from blood from black donors, Drew resigned from his position at the Red Cross, arguing that there was no scientific basis for keeping blood separated by race. The Red Cross would end this policy in 1950. Dr. Charles Drew's life-saving legacy lives on today every time someone gives blood and helps to save a life. Here's a line from a research paper by Sylvester James Gates, better known as Jim Gates. He wrote that, Remarkably, the fundamental prepotentials describing these dual elements of the super verisora algebra in each model agrees with the known prepotentials of the corresponding supergravity theory. And if that means anything to you, well then, I'm impressed. And here you see Jim Gates receiving the National Medal of Science from President Barack Obama. Obama's science and technology advisor said of Gates, as important as Jim's contributions have been in physics, I'm equally appreciative of the work he has done to inspire the next generation of doers and makers. But let's listen to Gates himself talking about how he became interested in science. About age six or seven, I had just learned how to read, and my dad brought home some books on space travel. I was born in 1950, nobody had ever been in space. So when I was reading about space travel, this was like, you know, the far edge of what one could think about. And I became very excited. And I thought about becoming an astronaut. It was um, in my junior year of high school, I took a physics course. I had a fantastic physics teacher, a gentleman by the name of Mr. Freeman Coney. And one day in class, he showed me the closest thing to magic I have ever seen in my life. He did this experiment where you take a board, and you tilt it, and you let a ball roll down the board. And then you take a stopwatch and time it. And it turns out that the distance the ball travels down the board is proportional to the square of the time on the stopwatch. And he wrote this equation, and it describes what's going on. I was thunderstruck, because I had always thought of mathematics as being an element of imagination. It was just like making up stories about space flight or reading comic books about superheroes. It was a game of play for me, I, and it was always inside of my head. But to see mathematics suddenly leap outside of my head and be in the world around, around me, I was like, how can this possibly be? As the chairman of the physics department at the University of Maryland said about Jim Gates, he said, he's everywhere and he's everywhere at an incredibly high level. I like to say there's a lot of people who have great contributions to science. There's very few people like Jim Gates who can do what he does on that scale at that level of excellence. When Dr. Sosina Hailey wanted to create a new kind of fuel cell that would mimic the way plants split apart water molecules, she needed to find a catalyst that would do so. But, well, what is a catalyst? Let's ask Dr. Hailey. A catalyst is, is something that makes something else happen faster. So let's say you're sitting there in bed and you need to go to school and your mom comes in and tells you get out of bed because you need to go to school. That's the catalyst in that scenario. <laughs> okay, This is something that was going to happen anyway, but just needed to be speeded up. So that's what the catalyst does. So Sina Hailey said, we have a big energy problem and we have to think big. So she came up with this, well, this goo this, that works like a fuel cell and you just can smear it on something and then you hook it up and the thing produces electricity. Isn't that cool? It's a new kind of fuel cell that works the same way a leaf does. It's a fuel cell designed by nature. And here's something even cooler. 
when all the fuel cell companies said, well, we don't want to change the way we do things, she said, well, I'll just build this fuel cell in my lab. I'll do it myself. And so she did. And then two of her students started a company called Super Protonic, and they are actually producing these fuel cells that she has the patent on. Another beautiful thing is that the output of her fuel cells is not nasty gas that will choke you. It's water, pure water. She actually once drank the water coming out of the tailpipe to show that it was just pure water. What an innovator. Dr. Sosina Hiley, scientist.